Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing some of the challenges of running a classical performing arts organization with Paul Helfrich, uh, Executive Director of Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra, who previously ran the Dayton Performing Arts Alliance, which combined a ballet, opera, and symphony, and the West Virginia Symphony Orchestra, and also the Erie Philharmonic. So, Paul, this is going to be a great discussion because we get to cover an awful lot of ground with you. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. So, um, you know, through the years, you've seen these classic arts organizations evolve from the earliest parts of your career to today. And the audiences have changed. The, um, the sensibility around classical music has changed, perhaps becoming a little bit more distant than it was in the past. Um, how do you adjust uh, to the changing tastes of the time, to the changing circumstances of the time? We've gone through COVID. It's been a real uh, dance. It's been a real complicated um, journey that you've undertaken. And, and today, you face the same challenges of trying to get audiences in the door, get those butts in those seats, and also developing just this relationship, this interactive relationship with your audiences. How do you see that having evolved over the years? Well, it's it's a real work in progress. Let's let's put it that way. I think every orchestra is is struggling with the answers post COVID because the answers are different in every community, and that's that's the thing. Um, let let me give one good example. Many orchestras during the pandemic, and ours did to some extent as well, uh, leaned into virtual programming. You know, oh, we got to put things online. You know, we can. We can put five musicians six feet apart in a room wearing masks. We could record something, you know. So, so that's what we did. Uh, and then the question a lot of us faced is, well, do we continue to try to do that? And our answer here in Orlando has pretty much been no. And the reason is, I think that you know, once you step into that platform and say we're going to put our content online, now you're competing with the Detroit Symphony and the Berlin Philharmonic and any number of ensembles who not only are really good but have put a lot of time over the years into developing this very thing. A lot of us learned that hey, it is not enough to just play in front of a camera. You know, you've got to have, uh, in addition to excellent sound editing, uh, you know, excellent video capability, including uh, the, the wherewithal to put together a really polished program. And not all of us are there and not all of us are in a position to make the investment. So what, what I think a lot of us do is we say, okay, well, how can we, how can we really demonstrate the value of having an orchestra in this uh, community? Because, you know, this was something we asked a lot in Dayton because, you know, the Cincinnati Symphony was an hour down the road and, uh, uh, you know, there were lots of other good orchestras in, in Ohio. And, and I think the niche that a local orchestra has to fill is to do the things that, that you know, you can only do if you're there 365 days a year. Uh, education is a huge part of that. So our education program here in Orlando is a major part of what we do. We have musicians going out into the community uh, and schools, children's hospitals. Uh, we reach over 70,000 people with our young people's concerts, which this year we're able to return to in-person presentation. So we say when we do things like that, we're able to provide an experience that no visiting orchestra, no matter how good they might be, uh, could provide. And uh, we also allow our audience a chance to really connect personally with, with our artists, with, with our music director, with our musicians, of course, and maybe with guest artists that, you know, if we feel they've established a particular rapport that we bring back again. Those are some of the things that we do, but there, there are challenges without question. You know, as, as I look at the field, you know, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The, the good news is that the supply of musicians is better than ever. There is no lack of people uh, honing their skills as an artist in conservatory and coming out ready to just step right into an orchestra. I mean, it, it's amazing uh, the 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 depth of talent that you'll have, you know, even in a smaller regional orchestra when you advertise a principal position. There's the good news. Um, the good news, uh, the bad, less good news is that in every orchestra I've served, you know, I can remember yeah, being there four or five years and then inevitably somebody that I've met who was just a really loyal supporter and came to everything 
would pass away and you'd have more and more of those and you sure you would see new people coming but you're it's rare that you see a new patron step up with that same level of fervor <laughs> that we found uh in earlier generations and i think it's just a it's simple symptomatic of that loyal audience that would almost come no matter what kind of fading and you know we see that reflected all around the country in the subscription sales because that was the traditional model how orchestras got people in now that's kind of fading out a little bit uh then the other way that it affects fundraising is you see shifts in generational giving where affluent families maybe families fortunate enough to have set up a family foundation the grandchildren have different priorities than their parents or their grandparents did. And so we're really having to make the case, some cases successfully, other cases less so, that the arts and the orchestra should remain the priority that they were. And another thing, and I will wrap up here in just a moment, uh, is uh, that especially in the smaller cities, uh, that the corporate changes. Um, you know, there used to be in, in a city like Dayton, to give you an example, uh, many uh, companies headquartered there um, that uh, that that uh, you know relocated, went to you know Charlotte or Atlanta or someplace like that, and so now you don't have the local decision makers, you don't have the local executive base that can really direct philanthropy. And another one that I've seen everywhere has been banking. You know, I had a board president in West Virginia who said, you know, yeah, 10 years ago, I could walk down the street and I could stop in each bank and, you know, the season would be sponsored by the time I got to the end of the block. And uh, it's not that way anymore. I mean, now it feels like there's like five banks in the whole country, you know, and, and so getting support at the local level in that particular industry is much harder than it used to be. I mean, there's usually some token amount, but it's not as generous it was as it was. And I think that reflects that that ongoing trend towards consolidation and decentralized or more centralized uh, control. Um, so those are things we're contending with. I think there's also the the issue, if you look comparatively across the performing arts and particularly music, there are certain forms that have crossed boundaries of ethnicity and race and, and tradition. If you look at the blues, for example, and then how that infected what rock and and rock then infected hip hop and hip hop infected right or or jazz right jazz has it, it, you know it started off in african american communities down in new orleans it spread throughout the country and now jazz is an international musical form right but if you take a look at the three classic arts symphony opera and ballet they've been less um uh successful in engaging across those boundaries. And so your audiences uh, generally tend to be of European extraction. Your donors, your older donors tend to be of, of European extraction, which uh, means basically white. So how do you create a, an experience that is embraced by a much broader uh, uh, demographic, a much broader age, uh, range of, of ages and do the thing that the blues has done, which is, you know, if you go to a blues festival, you see people of all ages, you know, from the very young to the very old, right? You see people of all uh, ethnicities, traditions, you see people of South Asian and East Asian extraction, you see people who are black and white and, and Latin, Hispanic, and, and all these different, different uh, folks coming together. Wouldn't it be great to see that audience mix right in all the different art forms well and it, you're, you're absolutely right and i and i think uh, i think a lot of the issues that the classical arts opera ballet and symphony have do relate to the way that we fund the arts in this country because we rely so heavily on private philanthropy you know they they asked john dillinger why he robbed banks he said well that's where the money is and so that's why you know, orchestras and opera companies are so often associated with the very wealthy because they have the money uh, to fund them. So, you know, it just, it, I'm not going to say fortunately or unfortunately, it is what it is, but we have all kind of become associated with black tie galas and uh, the support of the very affluent. And um, I think that is 
much more our problem than 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 somehow a lack of appeal to any particular. But it doesn't need to be that way. If you look yeah. at the gaming community, for example, which is all young people, right? I mean, I can't press those buttons fast enough. Yeah, yeah. And you look at the phenomenal music that comes out of there, right? Classically informed music. If you look at film, right? And I don't care, you know, whether it's it's um, a Fast and Furious movie or um, a John Wick movie or, you know, any of the other um, really um, sort of amazing things that are coming out of the film industry. What is the background music? You know, it is Absolutely. it is very yeah, sophisticated yeah. stuff. Oh, right? oh, for sure, for sure. And so that you know that that it really is my point is that the music is not the problem. I mean, I think the music you know can connect with anyone anywhere, but we have put up certain you know baggage around our our field that may make people say, "Well, that isn't for me." I mean, I know this is. A controversial idea, you know, particularly here in Florida, but I do think there have been systemic inequities in our country. That is why, you know, the main reason why there are fewer, fewer people of color who have generational wealth. And as I mentioned, it's the generational wealth that is tends to be largely associated with, the, you know, the museums and the, the symphonies and the traditional arts. But the, the appeal of the music, you know, is, is huge. And, uh, I, I always say, you know, I just say, God bless John Williams, because, you know, there are there are so many people in classical music who, you know, the first thing they want to tell you is poo poo and say, oh, he told he stole this from so and so he did. Look, what he's done is he has put millions of people in love with the sound of an orchestra and that unique sound, you know, uh, that that only an orchestra can make. And that is something that, that, you know, we can build on for, for all sorts of music. Yeah, so Arthur Fiedler with his so Boston much, but... Pops before that, yep. Leonard Bernstein with his, with his education yep. programs. But let's talk about your education programs, because that is a, that is a way where you can scale across um, a, a, a broad area. Um, how do you view your education programs? Is it a way to create uh, a more, um, uh, uh, locked in, informed audience so that they're they're actually equipped to uh, to understand your your uh, main stage performances, and is it is it a way to create a relationship at a very very low cost of engagement? I mean, I see, for example, that you have these online um, uh, uh, virtual music lessons and yes. some other offerings that. You know, it doesn't it doesn't require me to do an annual subscription. I can if if I'm interested in in picking uh, up uh, a a particular instrument, um, I have that resource right here. That's right, and and I think I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the best things that came out of the pandemic. That's when we started that, and afterwards we realized, hey, this is something we really really ought to keep because there are barriers of you know transportation and and so forth that. That would be hard to overcome if we go back to all physical instruction. So um, we offer those uh, both for you know traditional students as well as as older musicians. We have people from age seven to seventy seven participating uh, in the, in the virtual lessons, and um, yeah, that that is something that that has allowed us to reach out and you know maybe put aside some of those barriers of travel and 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 cost that that might otherwise uh, be there. Uh, but uh, I, I really think with with education programs, it's it's you, you, what you're doing is, you know, we kind of all have to do it because people are so mobile these days. I mean, maybe 60 years ago, I think people said, well, what we're doing is we're building an audience in this community. And now I'd probably say, well, you might be doing that. But a lot of these people who are in third through fifth grade now will, you know, will have moved on by the time they're adults. But. I think overall, you're building people who have some knowledge, some appreciation of, of the classical arts who can say, yeah, you know, I heard an orchestra, I went to a concert. And so the nature of the experience that we provide is so important because, you know, I always say when we talk about, you know, our, our programs for the young people's concerts and how various things are going over and, and, you know, whether we should include this or include that, I always just say the main thing I want I mean, yes, it's great if kids leave and they know the difference between a clarinet and an oboe. But the main thing I want is them to say, I went to an orchestra 
and I had a great time. I went to an orchestra and it was fun and I loved the music and it, you know, it made me feel happy I was there. Uh, and if we can do that, that, that I think is, is really important to set up that first experience. And sure, you know, maybe some of them will play an instrument. Maybe some of them will, you know, develop an appreciation for it. Maybe it's something that they'll come back to later. But, but I think there's, there's like a real long tail uh, benefit but, you know, ultimately, all of us in the arts believe strongly that th th this kind of activity, this kind of exposure helps make people better people because it broadens their perspective on, on others, on history, on expression uh, in, in ways that, uh, you know, that really only music can do. Do you ever deconstruct a, a piece in the, you, you mentioned John Williams and you mentioned some of the criticism and and uh of course he's he's received so many uh, awards as well and so much right, right of course but yeah. do you ever take take pieces and start to deconstruct how a composer might put those together or do comparative um examinations so so that your audience can get a sense of the composer's work in creating what they are hearing um, or um, going back to uh, some of the, the some of the Lida, uh, which are the the uh, vocal works that basically take folk works and transcribe them into a, um, a a different type of performance backed by a symphony orchestra, whereas um, they they might have just been uh, folk songs that were um, were a song without a, accompaniment or with uh, some sort of a lute like instrument. Uh, or or a flute. Um, how 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 do you uh, get people engaged in the structure of music so that they understand that part of the experience? Yeah, well, I think um, you know that that is, I think, a big part of the responsibility of the the music director or in a larger orchestra of a conducting staff because those are so often the people who are in a position whether they're speaking from the podium or doing something that's expressly a educational activity like a pre-concert talk or, or, or the, something like that, uh, to find ways to do that that are accessible and that, that, that are aware that there aren't that many people, even in an orchestra audience anymore, who may be aware of what a, you know, a triad or a dominant seventh chord is and so forth. So to do it in a way uh, that's elevating yet accessible. And, you know, yeah, with the kids, uh, you know, I mentioned with the young people's concerts and keeping the experience fun, we always try to have the orchestra play something that we know uh, that, 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 uh, that, that they're going to know. Um, so, you know, we always work in something that they can sing along. Um, you know, up here in Orlando, no surprise, we tend to lean heavily into the Disney repertoire uh, for that sort of thing. But I think it, well, the value of that, especially with kids, is they say, aha, I know that song and the orchestra played it. So the orchestra plays music I like, not just music that you know somebody got up and told me was from 200 years ago. So I, I think it's really important to, to, to make that connection. But you can't get that playing. experience in the New York Philharmonic. You cannot get that experience in the LA Philharmonic. You don't yeah. have that kind of a, a, a relationship. And that is also part of the experience, right? It's it's being part and parcel of this um, of this performance, right? You're you're not just sitting there uh, passively. Mm -hmm. There's some interaction there. Yeah, that's I think that's really important uh, for kids because see that's one of the the challenges that we have is that the traditional orchestra experience is a passive listening experience. And we're in a culture that, that demands interaction and shareability and, you know, all the, these kind of things that people uh, typically think of, you know, uh, of an experience of being able to share it with their friends and uh, interact with it uh, in, in real time. Uh, and so the last thing we want to do with kids or younger people is to do that traditional, you come in, you sit quietly, you don't clap between movements, and at the end, you, you show your appreciation, uh, but, but instead have a format that, that kind of does connect with the way they experience things. I think another thing orchestras are going to wrestle with is uh, the element of, of, of visuals, because the orchestra experience is also visually rather static, you know, of course, people who who love it and have been around it forever, you know, say, well, I'm, you know, I hang on every motion of the conductor and I 
you know, I like to watch the the way the concert master responds in certain situations and all those sorts of things. But most people are just looking, you know, they say, well, there are people sitting in chairs. You know, I, I went to, uh, you know, a, a contemporary music concert and there, there were some people were dancing and people were moving around. There was huge video screens I could see, you know, up close to the, the face of the performer. And so, you know, we have to we have to think there's more and more of an expectation that at least in some situations we'll we'll be able to provide that sort of experience. What kind of uh, initiatives are you planning for the next couple of years? What are, what are your priorities going forward? Oh, um, well, that's that, that's a great. I'm glad you mentioned that. One thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out uh, pops because a lot of orchestras now that have had pop series, you know, it used to be one of the, the most surefire things you could have. But now a lot of us are seeing, hey, what's going on here? Our pops audience is actually older than our classics audience, you know, uh, so we haven't replenished them. And that's because pops can mean uh, so many different things. Um, you know, in Dayton, we were able to successfully take kind of a baby boomer classic rock audience and make that its own series. So that way we weren't having too many things on the pop series where, you know, the older people said, oh, it's just too loud or something. So we were able to kind of lean more into, you know, Great American Songbook and jazz, movie music, holidays, that sort of thing. So we do that in Orlando, but, you know, it's kind of a mixed result. So now we are really emphasizing the visual and trying to think of at a pops concert, let's give people lots to look at. You know, let's have uh, a magic performer. Let's have, uh, you know, the the Cirque. Let's let's have a film and and that seems to be going so far. So we've kind of made pops our, our laboratory for a lot of that. Uh, another thing is that we are seeing that, uh, you know, far, far more than than putting out another statement about how inclusive you are, just show it on the stage. If you bring in diverse artists, you'll see diversity start to show uh, in your audience, particularly when you bring in artists that uh, are willing to do a lot of outreach and, and, and go out in the community and make connections uh, directly, at, at, you know, at schools, universities, and so forth. So we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, good responses with that. Um, with contemporary music, one thing that Eric Jacobson, our music director, has done really well is, I think, identify composers that, that, are, that are fresh and new but whose music will connect well with our audience. And, and you know, that's going to vary from community to community, uh, but then have them do more than one thing so people get to know them. And, you know, we're next year, for the third year in a row, we're going to play a piece by James Lee III. And, you know, we're really very fortunate to be uh, working with him. But now that's a name that rather than, oh, I don't know who that is. It's not Mozart. Now our our audience knows who he is and uh, has a certain element of, of trust established. Um, and then another thing uh, that, that I think Eric's been really good about is he's a great mentor. I mean, at only four years old, but he's already a great mentor to people coming up in the conducting profession. And uh, we have uh, really made a point to give women more opportunities and to, again, help our audience, our musicians, everyone, uh, become more accustomed so that, you know, hopefully very soon we'll get to a point where that's no longer, wow, you know, that's, uh, you don't see that all the time, but you, you get to the point where it's more every bit uh, the, the norm. So those well, are some things we're doing. You're making some really important points. These are business decisions, right? You right. are creating educational programming to serve your audience, your clientele, and to get them engaged, Right. You are scheduling people who will get different audience cohorts engaged, broadening your customer base, whether it's uh, female conductors uh -huh. um, or whether it is uh, composers or conductors or artists of color, right? Uh, whether it is taking um, Disney, familiar Disney tunes and playing them in the repertoire so that your children are engaged or whether you're giving people visually stimulating experiences to create a higher degree of interest and diversify the audience to people who want music, but also different types of stimulation. What you're doing is you're creating an offering that is interesting. Oh my goodness, <laughs> right? Oh right. my goodness. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I, I say, you know, a lot of times to people that are trying to like, why do orchestras do, you know, I said, you got to understand if think of an orchestra as almost like a faith based organization, because if you feel like you have like the true creed, 
you're not going to want to change it. I mean, you're going to be like, well, this is it. And we're going to do what we do. And, you know, we're going to tell people how great it is, but then, you know, it's up to them uh, to come. And what we try to do is, you know, we say, look, the orchestra can play all sorts of music. We have the, the great core repertoire that really made the orchestra into the ensemble it is today. Uh, and, and we want to always have that at the center, but there's so many other things we can do. And there's so many other things we can do that can be meaningful in this community. Yeah. Just, just as you said. So that's, that's kind of the, the overarching principle of all that. And to me, what I find to be so fascinating is that if you look at the modern orchestra and its structure and its instruments and so on, that, and you start to go back in history, you see as, as you go back, this change in um in the sensibility surrounding this art form from its earliest stages where basically you just had people with instruments coming together to play folk tunes right mm -hmm. and then over time those instruments shifted and and they became larger and larger and for larger gatherings you needed a certain formality and so you had to have different sections right so now we have right. a certain section and and then and then the the technologies evolve. So you go from having um, the the early uh, types of of uh, percussive instruments down to the piano now, which is a highly technical and evolved instrument. Right? What we have here now is going back to that connection and community, isn't it? Right? It's going back to getting people involved, and and that's being criticized because it's now it's no longer the formal thing but yeah. it really doesn't need to be can't it just be fun for kids yeah yeah absolutely i mean you, you, it's an excellent point because you know there 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 are a lot of good things to that history right as mu music moved out of the salon and out of the chamber it went onto a stage where like the public could come what a concept so the orchestra had to get bigger it had to get louder composers wanted to ne use new instruments but then over time once it became an institution you know, there started to develop a, a barrier, if you will, you know, between right. the audience and what was happening on stage. And so, yes, now we're trying to kind of break Deconstruct that. those barriers, yeah. right? Deconstruct right. the barriers. And that's really happening in, in local environments where that's so important. Smaller cities, right? You're, it's not going to happen in the large cities in Chicago or L.A. or Pittsburgh or, you know, the places with, with renowned orchestras that work fairly well although they too right. have challenges it's going to be in places that need to be more audience responsive because if you're not audience responsive you don't have a future right that's right that's absolutely right yeah and we have to be very uh you know um thoughtful about how we go about it because all of us even if we're not the chicago symphony we have business models that emulate that uh, like most orchestras have a schedule work rules collective bargaining all that set up to facilitate an orchestra that gives concerts in a downtown concert hall on Saturday night, you know, with the idea being that people come and gather in a large space to hear it. Okay, so that's still, we're still going to do that, but we have to be able to get out of that and get out to other places and have smaller groups that, you know, will fit in smaller places and that are affordable for community presenters and all those sorts of things have to now be part of the mix as well as that core business. Well, Paul Hoyle, for uh, Executive Director of Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra, thank you so much for allowing us to gain a little bit of insight into your world. Thanks for sharing the work of your musicians, of your, your uh, funders, your audiences, your community, um, your volunteers. It is just so wonderful to have you here, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure.